Hi everyone and welcome to History Infection. This time I'm going to be talking about a short history of cancer. This involves questions like, why would a cell voluntarily kill itself? And we're going to meet a woman who now weighs around 40 tons. Now before I get into it, this is a history of an infection, so why am I talking about cancer? Well some cancers definitely are caused by things like viral infections and other sorts of horrible infections. Cancers also share a kind of fundamental principle that some infections share too. They are trying to extract nutrients from their host, us in this case, at the cost of their host. Much in the same way any sort of infection, be it viral, bacterial, or parasite does, cancer also plays by similar rules. It's also dealt with in much the same way by the immune system. Cancer is constantly being attacked by uh, your immune cells that are looking out for things that don't fit in. This includes cells that have become or are in the process of becoming cancerous. That out of the way, let's begin. Cancer has got its name after the crab, and it was named by Hippocrates to describe the sort of central body mass you would see in cancers and these tendrils coming out. Hippocrates also made a distinction between malignant tumours and benign tumours. For the sake of clarity through this, if I call something cancer, I'm typically talking about a malignant tumour. Although depending on different stages of how cancer progresses, there's a bit of a gray area in between. But for the most case, I'm not talking about benign tumors, I'm talking about malignant cancerous growths. The term oncologist actually comes from a, a different father of medicine, Galen, who used the word from Greek for swelling, onkos, to describe people who looked at the swelling of humans, the oncologists. I'll be coming up with a video later about what is cancer, but in the meantime, cancer is when a cell has developed several mutations, which means it can no longer control its own cell death. It also has to find a way to avoid the immune system, avoid being detected as one of these renegade cells, or be able to go quicker than the immune system can cope with it as a renegade cell. Most of us develop cancerous tissues at some point throughout our lives, but luckily, the vast majority of them are destroyed by our immune system going around and finding these non-cooperating cells. The word cancer can apply to over 200 different recognized diseases and probably a whole bunch of unrecognized ones as well. The problem is this, let's say unfortunately you and I develop a cancer that affects our skin. Now we both have skin cancer. However, that's where the similarities might stop. First, we're not identical twins, so my cells and your cells aren't exactly the same. And we also don't have the same immune system. Mine might be better or worse than yours. This means that the chance of that cancer spreading or developing into a full grown cancer where the immune system can't stop it is different between the two of us. Also, on top of this, in order to become a cancerous cell, the cell must undergo several different mutations. Normally one mutation isn't enough to make a cell become cancerous. There's at least normally around four or five different mutations in all sorts of different cell pathway mechanics that tend to regulate apoptosis or cell death that will allow a cell to become cancerous. And there's no reason to suggest that the mutations that happen in my cells are the same the mutations that happen in your cells, even if they are, even the exact same gene, the chance of them being in exactly the same place or exactly the same mutation is very, very small. So even the different slight differences in the protein causing that cell to become cancerous could be completely different. For example, even if it's in the exact same position on the gene, it might somehow interact and present itself better to my immune system or better to your immune system, meaning your cancer is easily cleared compared to mine. It's an incredibly complex issue and it also means the more complex and advanced we make our medications to sort of tackle these designer points of different cancer treatments means you exclude more and more people from the potential treatment because it no longer applies to them. They don't have that kind of specific cancer. And remember, we both apparently have exactly the same cancer. Let's move on to history before I depress us all a bit more. Cancer was known about before Hippocrates and Galen, and it's mentioned in some ancient Egyptian texts quite clearly. Unlike other infections, if we're calling cancer an infection like HIV and syphilis, cancer is very old. The properties of what makes something cancerous are probably as old as life itself. The ability to cheat on something else's processes is what makes cancer work. Cancer has a different set of rules from the rest of life that tends to cooperate when acting as a, as a group and allows it to manipulate and play a different game to get an advantage. Cancer was thought up until the 16th century to be due to an unbalance of something called black bile, but the notion was dismissed when we discovered the lymphatic system 
and it was discovered that cells come from other cells. This gave people to understand the notion that cells are able to mutate into other cells. Although the idea that cancer cells were renegade cells wasn't shown until much, much later. Now, it might sound strange, but your cells kill themselves en masse almost every day. To make a human being, to make the spaces in between my fingers, when I was developing in the womb, this space here was all filled in with a whole bunch of cells. You can sometimes see people have webbed fingers and webbed toes. They're not grown extra bits of skin. They haven't lost the bits of skin that have always been there. The cells there go undergo something called apoptosis, which means they kill themselves. But how does a behavior like this start evolutionary? How does something learn to kill itself? How does that get spread onto further generations if it has killed itself? Like all things in biology, we, we already know the answer. It's evolution, evolution, evolution. For a while it was thought that evolution couldn't explain these kind of altruistic acts, and it was undarwinian of life to be able to do this. It wasn't until the 1960s that a group of biologists actually came up with a theory that showed how altruistic actions can be evolutionarily stable and passed on through generation to generation. Sally LePage has made a fantastic video explaining Hamilton and Hamilton's life, and you can click here to go see it. Evolution doesn't act on the individual or the population, it acts on the genes. It is the genes that matter, and not the individual and not the party. It is the idea of this selfish gene where if a gene is able to reproduce itself better in certain environments, then it will spread. This also includes when the gene is able to help itself in other bodies reproduce better. Genes that look out and care for other copies of themselves survive, even if those other copies are in other individuals. Cells are acting altruistic when they kill themselves off in mass because the rest of the cells around them in our bodies are as close as 100% identical as any other cell could ever be. So to the genes, it doesn't matter if cell A survives or cell B survives. All that matters is that if A helps B survive, then it's exactly the same. Cancer cells cheat on the rest of your cells, extracting all sorts of nutrients and poisoning other ones for their own selfish ends because they've lost several of the genes that regulate their ability to kill themselves. Now moving on to how much do you weigh? Probably more than you like, maybe less than you like, but you probably haven't got anything on the world's heaviest person. Harriet Lax is estimated to weigh somewhere between 20 and 40 tons. She's also been legally dead for 50 years, but I could go to the lab right now and go and meet her. I first came across her and actually mistook her as a hamster. That might need some more explanation. During my undergrad, we were learning about all these sorts of cell processes, and we were looking at Chinese hamster mouse ovary cell lines. Then we looked at something called HeLa cells, and I just assumed the H stood for hamster as well. However, it stands for Harrietta of Harrietta Lax. Harrietta is not an unsung heroine of science. She is, in my opinion, a victim of exploitation. However, her victimization has led to many outstanding breakthroughs and countless lives saved. She was born Louetta Pleasant in around 1920 and her mother died soon after her birth in around 1924. During this time her father decided to split the family up because he could no longer really look after them and Harrietta went to go live with her grandfather. At the age of 21 she married David Lax. She during this time had five children and she assumed that several of the lumps she felt during pregnancy were normal and correct for a pregnant woman. But it was during her fifth child when she began to bleed quite heavily during her pregnancy. Her doctor initially tested her for syphilis and when that came back negative, her doctor referred her to John Hopkins Hospital. Now John Hopkins is currently a fantastic hospital. It's one of the best in the world probably, but this was 1951 and Harriet Lax was African American. So when she noticed these unusual symptoms, when she went to her doctor, the only hospital she could actually go to to get any sort of treatment in her area was John Hopkins, because the rest wouldn't treat African-American people. The doctor who treated her at the hospital, Howard Jones, examined her and discovered that she had stage one cervical cancer. She was treated by having tubes with radioactive sources sewn into her cervix and given x-ray therapy. Importantly, two samples were taken this time, one of the cancerous tissue and one of the healthy tissue, apparently without her permission or consent. These samples were then given to George Otter Gray. Harriet Alex at this time was admitted back to hospital, but unfortunately she died of kidney failure. She was buried in an unmarked grave and her family tried to move on knowing that she was now gone. However, unbeknown to her family, 
part of her was still very much alive. The doctor had examined the samples taken from the cancerous tissue and found they had quite a unique property. Unlike normal cell lines, which you can grow for a few generations, Harriet Alaxas seemed to be effectively immortal. You could kill them, sure, but no matter how many times you plated them back out and took a sample, moved it to the next plate, took a sample, moved it to the next plate, they just seemed to grow again quite happily. Normally cell lines can't survive a few pasteurizations. Harriet Alexis could seemingly go on indefinitely. The biggest effect of this was that the researchers working with cell lines could effectively spend less time trying to maintain their cell lines. They used to spend almost all their time just trying to keep these cells alive. Also, it meant that the scientists around the world could all work from the same basis. They could all use the same cells and look for the same properties. Again, if you took my cells and your cells and examined them, like we do, for example, with macrophages, you'd find that my macrophages and your macrophages act a little bit differently sometimes because we're effectively, we are different people. They have different DNA. But Harriet Alaxa cells, the HeLa cells, as they became known, of course, all shared the same DNA. So scientists all around the world could start working from the same basis. Her cells have been used in almost every aspect of human biology research. But it wasn't until the 1970s that her family actually discovered that her cells had been taken and used in this way when researchers, genetic researchers, started calling up her family and asking questions about the genetics of them, such as what eye colour, did they have cleft chins, and all these sorts of detailed genetic questions. And this led the family to sort of question why were the researchers calling them, and they found that they were using her cell line in genetic research and wanted to try and see if they could pinpoint other parts of the family and try and work out a genetic tree. As I said earlier, Harrietta is not really a heroine. She did not make the choice to have her body used in this way, but the ramifications of the injustice have had such great benefits to mankind, it's really difficult to understand how we should, or how I should feel about this story. I honestly don't know in reflection if this was a moral thing to do. I'll leave that for you, and if you have any thoughts or comments, leave them below. I'll finish with the inscription on her tomb, which was donated by Dr. Ronald Pilato in 2010. Harriet Alax, August 1st, 1920 to October 4th, 1951. In loving memory of a phenomenal woman, wife and mother who touched the lives of many, here lies Harriet Alax, healer. Her immortal cells will continue to help mankind forever. Eternal love and admiration from your family. So that brings us to an end of this history infection. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to like and subscribe on that fantastic stuff. I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be talking about a short history of Ebola. See you then. Thanks for watching.